Everyone here, in, in one way or another, has experienced some kind of struggles in life. It's simply inevitable. It's just, it's just a part of, part of this life. Everyone experiences brokenness and struggle in some way. Friday was a harsh, scary, painful reminder of just how broken this world is. As we all struggle with this new level of uh, nightmarish brokenness in the world as we process what happened in Connecticut. We all struggle with this. And I come to you today as a fellow struggler. But I'd like to set that, that deep kind of struggle aside for a moment. And I'd like to share with you a, a much simpler kind of struggle, a personal one. Maybe some of you know, probably not many, but I, I grew up with a learning disability, really struggling. And for the most part, it, it, uh, it presented itself in, in really being challenged by reading in a lot of ways, especially reading out loud in front of people. Uh, I, I, you know, I start sentences at the end of them, and then I get to the end of the sentence and not know how to start it or finish it because I didn't start right. I flip words around, and, and, and reading out loud was always a real struggle for me, reading in general. But as I, as I grew up with this, with this struggle, I felt really often that there was just something broken about me. I couldn't read like the other kids in my classes. I couldn't, I couldn't think like them. It seemed so easy for everyone else. Well, in our story today, we hear uh, about this priest named Zachariah who has his own kind of struggle. After a choice encounter with the angel Gabriel, he was rendered mute, unable to speak even a word. Throughout the entire pregnancy of his wife, Elizabeth, he was unable to speak a word. I imagine that was pretty frustrating for Elizabeth. Even at the birth of his son, he wasn't even able to tell people who came to him, what, what will he be named? He wasn't even able to tell them. He had to write it down. His name is John. But then, immediately, his mouth was opened, his tongue was freed, and after months and months and months of silence, he spoke, and people were amazed. Then, filled with the Holy Spirit, Zechariah began to prophesy, to foretell what God had made known to him. People heard this prophecy with even more amazement, even more intrigue, due to his having been mute for so many months. There was something broken about Zechariah, his voice. No matter how hard he struggled, he could not speak. But God grew or great fruit out of Zechariah's struggle. Out of his broken voice came a great prophecy. I think I have a different appreciation for this story than most because of my learning disability. While I was certainly able to speak growing up, and I spoke a lot, as you might imagine, I couldn't, for the life of me, read out loud in public without, without faltering, without, without stumbling, without misplacing words and losing my place. Every time I tried to read out loud, I was reminded how much of a failure I was in doing such a simple thing. But one year when I was in college, I decided to work at a camp for the summer. It was an ELCA camp I've told you about a few times. And not only did this job require that uh, you know I had to I had to get wilderness first aid certified and, and first responder certified and, and, and I did learn to canoe and all these all these kind of skills, but but it also required me to read. It required me to read out loud in public. I had to lead Bible study with groups of youth. And out of all the kinds of certifications and, and, and skills that I needed to learn to have this job for the summer. The one I was petrified of, the one I was most afraid of, was having to read in the woods with you. I thought, I don't know how I'm going to do this. But God brought me there to that camp, and, and something happened. 
Something new. Something changed. I still stumbled my way through these Bible studies with the youth, and it was far from eloquent. But something changed. I felt God's presence with me. That reassuring presence saying, you can do this. Throughout college, I did my best to avoid classes that had any sort of reading or writing intensiveness to them whatsoever. I mean, I have a computer science degree for a reason. <laughs> I don't know. So, so imagine my surprise, years after graduating, when God put this persistent, nagging kind of call in my head to go to seminary. For years I thought, God, you must be crazy. <laughs> I think you've got the wrong guy. But eventually, after I seemed to not be able to escape this call to go to seminary, I, I said one final prayer before enrolling. I said, all right, God, if you want me to do this, you're going to have to get me through it. It's as simple as that, because I have no idea, I have no earthly clue how I was going to get through seminary. It was an entire curriculum of courses that I tried to avoid my entire life. Thanks. <laughs> but God did something new. God changed something in me. And to this day, I don't know what it is, or what happened, or how, how it happened, or how it worked, but it was as if God took away this block from me. It's as if I had that presence with me all along, saying, you can do this. I just wasn't able to hear it. Oh, no. Because obviously here I am today, not only you know teaching and preaching, but every once in a while even reading in front of a whole lot of people. And I don't know how I do it apart from God's presence. What God's made abundantly clear to me through my experience and through this text today is that God does amazing things. God grows beautiful fruit from all the broken pieces of our lives. God creates greatness out of struggle. Here's where my story differs from Zacharias, though. I do not believe that God uh, wanted me to struggle my way through the education system my whole life. I do not believe that God wanted me to have this learning disability uh, that, I, that I grew up struggling with. The way that we didn't quite hear it, but, but this, this encounter with the angel, Zachariah was able to speak it and do to a, a faith struggle. He was rendered mute. I don't believe that, that God made me this way to prove some point. But God did take that struggle, just the way he did with Zechariah, and bear great fruit from it. In the grand scheme of things, though, this learning disability, or even being mute, is, is far from the depths of struggle that, that many, many of you carry around every single day. The fact that, the fact is, I, I haven't experienced anything near kind of struggle that so many of you carry with you. As a pastor this week, I, I prayed with a lot of people who are, who are on this prayer list and, and people who have crossed paths with some of you living life struggling with deep pain that you carry on a daily basis, physical pain from, from broken bones left in the wake of car accidents, cancer, or disease without cure. Emotional pain left from having lost a loved one, even a child. I want to be very, very clear to say here that God does not put pain, injury, disease, violent death, tragedy, that kind of struggle into our lives for some divine purpose unknown to us now. One of the more damaging things that we Christians have a tendency to, to say really well meaningfully is, well, everything happens for a reason. No. Not everything happens for a reason. The 
tragedy that befell Newtown, Connecticut this Friday did not happen for some divine purpose. No. Not everything happens for a reason. Life, this world, God's will, is not some equation that comes out all balanced in the end. Not everything happens for a reason. But, in the wake of all kinds of brokenness in the world, God can and does do great things. God can make and grow meaning and purpose out of the shattered pieces of our lives, of the world. God can and does grow fruit from the brokenness of our lives, even in tragedy. We can't always see it at the time, not when we're in it. And God wouldn't want us to. But God is always at work in the world, picking up the broken pieces of our lives, holding them in love, and finding something new, something good, something whole to grow them into, to form them into. Our Father in heaven even knows the depth of sorrow felt by those who lose a child to violence. Even in the wake of, of the destruction left on the cross, God went to work picking up the broken pieces of his son and did something beautiful, something whole, something filled with love. But I'm getting way ahead of myself for the season, aren't I? At our weekly staff meeting this week, our office manager, Christy Katz, shared a personal story that just struck to the, to the core of, of what God had been talking to me about this text throughout the week. And I asked her permission to share a part of that story with you today. A little over 14 years ago, Christy was in a terrible car accident. Recovery was, was excruciating physically and emotionally. But then she said to us, with this joy, with a sense of life about her, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for that accident. I wouldn't have started working at the preschool. I wouldn't have moved up to the office. I wouldn't have become the office manager if it weren't for that accident. God only knows what he has in store for me next. She shared this story with us at our staff meeting because of an encounter that had happened that week, which, which somebody had come into the office who was struggling with a far, far more recent car accident and was really struggling, recovering, and living with a lot of pain. Christy shared with us that she didn't quite know what to say to this woman who stopped by the office. You know, she didn't want to betray the experience of struggle this person was currently living in. She wanted to betray that, that moment. But at the same time, conflicted, look what God can do. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for that. But then it happened, without saying anything, as they continued to, to talk when, the, when this visitor left the office, she stopped for a moment and turned to Christy and said, You know, Christy, seeing you here brings me hope. That's what God offers us through the scripture today, through God's living word. Not conclusion, but hope. Not a, not a wish, like, 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 I hope that those Christmas cookies taste as good as they smell. <laughs> and hope, like the very smell of the Christmas cookies as they bake. Bear with me for a second. It's like, hope is like, it's like peering in the oven window, not quite being able to see through the, through the steam on the window. I can't quite tell what they're going to look like, but boy, I can smell them. We trust our noses and we know that it's going to be good. But they're not ready yet. So that smell of them cooking is all we have to get us through. That's what we have to hold on to. That's the kind of hope that God offers us today. We don't know what they're going to look like. We don't know how that hope is going to take shape. 
but we know it's going to be good because we trust God. It's not here yet, though. So that hope is all we have to hold on to while we wait. God brings us hope through Zechariah's prophecy. Not just, uh, not just a little hope, but a, but a big hope from that, that little glimpse we get of that glimmering future. Hope in preparing for the one who is yet to come. Hope that there's someone great worth preparing for. Hope that God would rise up a great Savior. Hope that the Savior will pick up the broken pieces of our lives, of the world around us, and do something good. Hope that God will bring light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death. Hope that something big, something, something good, something right, something whole, something new is coming. But it's not here yet. And so, in hope, we pray. And in hope, 